So, wow, thanks everybody for coming out. This is, one, I am just honored to be in a, in a Ford facility, you know, have, I mean, I mean, it's a, you know, a brand that we all recognize. So I'm just like so excited to be with us in a startup, but I'm like at this like incredible place that's like doing really innovative stuff. And um, anyway, thanks for having me. Um, so, um, you know, I think everybody saw the title of the talk, but like I can go, so one, this is a smaller group. Uh, we usually get this, like lots of people sign up for meetups and don't come even though there is free food. Um, so we can, we can go lots of places, but like what I'd say is stop me um, at any point. If I don't like stop, like scream at me to stop and I'll stop, I promise. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I don't have the mic up here. Yeah, I tend to project, so I don't tend to put a mic on because it frightens people uh, when I do that. Uh, so we'll stick with this. Um, the, ha so here's the next question is, so I, I work at HO.ai, it's a, uh, we're about 50, it's a, it's a both a piece of open source software and a company that supports it uh, behind it. So like one of the questions is that I have, I'm just trying to gauge kind of the group and the interest because making it very flexible. How many of you have heard of like, it, we make machine learning software. So how many of you heard of H2O or, okay. How many would like to like, so I give this talk one of two ways. One of them is like the more just this stuff, right? And the other one is talk, I can balance it the other way, which is talk, you know, a little bit more about H2O. So how many want to hear a little bit more about H2O too um, versus kind of the use case sort of stuff? I can blend the two, but I can also like kind of balance them either way. Okay, so, okay, a few. So, okay, we'll cover that. So, but I won't, I won't belabor that, that fact then. Um, so, yeah, so this is, um, I'll put up one slide, um, and then I'll, I'll go cover rest of the presentation. So this is, uh, hopefully the slide comes up. Yes, excellent. So, um, so yeah, um, uh, H2O is an open source software package uh, platform. It's Apache V2 license, so it's really permissive license. You can go download it today, h2o.ai. Uh, try to remember that URL, because if you search for H2O on Google, you'll never find the website. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, but if you do H2O machine learning, you will. Um, so yeah, so it's, uh, the, um, and like I said, there's a company behind it that's been around for three or four or five years now building the software. And kind of the whole point is, is like, it's for in-memory machine learning. Um, and so it's, uh, it's super fast. It has all kinds of neat things for like doing memory compression. Um, and what I'd say is like, you won't find every algorithm in the book in it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more stuff you can go get out of, you know, Scikit or R, but what you'll find is kind of industrial strength algorithms for machine learning, so for speed and scale. So that's, that's kind of, um, that's kind of the bit. And if you, um, it, it works, uh, it'll work on your laptop. It just needs a Java VM. It works on your laptop, so you can download it and run it today. If anybody wants to do it afterwards, I'll hang around. If you brought a computer, we'll do it, uh, assuming that you can adjust your computer. Uh, and uh, runs in Hadoop, it runs in Spark, and it's got R and Python interfaces. So hopefully we've like made everybody that hacks happy. When I joined um, the company in April, um, I was actually doing Python work, but uh, they only had stuff in R, so I had to learn R. Um, I'm actually going to show code tonight. So like if my Python code's really bad, it's because my R codes, I had to learn R and then I went back to Python and like they're all bad now, but they, they work. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the trade-off. So um, real quick, like a little bit about my background. Um, so um, I, I was previously to HO at this company called John Deere. So another, another one of those brands in the world that a lot of people recognize. Um, I, uh, I tell people that I did get used to working around things that when you dropped them on your toe, they hurt. Now I work around software, nothing hurts, um, except for bugs. Um, so in my previous life, I spent a lot of time kind of dealing with, with data that was coming off of, of machines. So I've, I've crawled around tractors and combines and plugged uh, uh, CAN bus sniffers into CAN buses and tried to figure out how to get things off of satellite. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was what I was doing before I, I joined H2O. Uh, I did that for, I did, I worked at Deer for like 13 years and then, uh, but the, uh, the, the, the joy of startup life like brought me back. So I'm, I'm very excited to, to be here. I have a, I have a background in, in physics, even though I'm not a physicist. Uh, I have a background in engineering and management and I'm neither an engineer nor a manager. So uh, I've been professionally trained in lots of things I don't do. The, uh, um, 
So what, one of the things is, is that um, I try to make this case that like, if you're doing data science work, that I, 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 I think this like whole IoT space is just an exciting one to be. And this was a, a research report uh, by Beecham Research. It was talking about all kinds of places that uh, you know, these connected machines are now providing information from. And I, you know, a lot of my focus was previously in the industrial sector. Ford's is over here in the transportation sector. And, and I know some of this is a, uh, an eye chart, but at the end of this is, ends up being things like pumps and valves and motors and um, vehicles and uh, you know, all kinds of things that ultimately have some sort of sensor on them, like feeding data back. And the, I actually think that if you're in data, this is, um, you know, social data is really exploded. There's lots of stuff in kind of the social space. It's gigantic amounts of data. But I think this data, now that we've connected all the sensors together and are connecting them, like this is another place where data is just going to explode um, and is exploding. Um, and like I said, like as an, as an example, um, these are almost small numbers these days. I mean, I can't believe I'm like quoting last year's numbers, but in my prior employer, we ran one experiment and it created a 30 terabyte data set. And so those are, those are, those are decent sized data sets. And when you run, you know, 20 of those experiments, they get really big. And so I, I think that if you're in the data space and like dealing with data, this is a really interesting place to be. Um, so I kind of encourage people to try it out because I think there's all kinds of interesting places to be. So if you're in financial services, there's all kinds of cool financial services and your social media, there's all kinds of cool social media data to be. So I'm just, I think it's just an exciting time all the way around. Um, so like I said, it's going to be big. I, I, I ripped this from Hewlett Packard. Um, the, um, you know, kind of their point was is that this whole IoT data is going to get to be uh, Yoda bytes and Bronto bytes. Um, and I love that because I get to say Yoda and Bronto whenever I get to give this talk. Um, the, uh, um, but like, you know, I just talked about a 30 terabyte data set, right? So we're, um, we're talking, you know, 16, 14 orders of magnitude higher, you know, when you get up into Bronto bytes. So like, I mean, four, 10 to the 14th bigger, right? I mean, this is incredible. So I'm like, how big, I, I can't even wrap my head around how big that is, um, despite having like, a wife that does astrophysics. So I thought this chart from that HP also published was good. So um, a yottabyte is how much our federal government knows about us. So that gives you a sense. So uh, the uh, um, the zettabyte, uh, which is uh, that's how much network traffic that will be on the public internet this year. So about about a zettabyte of data um, to give some. Uh, let's see here. There's um, let's see where are we at here. There's one down here, yeah, Yoda bytes about how much we have on all of the 250 trillion DVDs in the world. Um, so yeah, so the whole point is, is like data is just, it's going to explode and you can see like many of these um, CERN, Large Hadron Collider creates, creates a petabyte per second. They don't keep all that. They look at every petabyte, they look at every byte and they throw most of it away because uh, they do lots of experimental replicas. So anyway, I think it's a great space to be. So I'm trying to make the case like, like you need, um, you need to think about this as you're doing this IoT stuff. This is the other thing I think is interesting about this, this censored Internet of Things is, is that we're going to get a very interesting loop. Um, we are getting a very interesting loop. So um, uh, the, um, I'm, the, the whole point is, is that you're going to get censored data, there's going to be some analysis, and then we're actually going to feed that back into control systems, right? The things that actually actuate things. We're not just, it's not going to be a read-only system out there. We're going to somehow feed that back into control systems. So I'm at Ford. How many people do like control systems sort of work? Okay. I'm not a control systems person either. Um, the, uh, but I do know what they are. So we're going to feed that back into control systems. I'll tell you, like I was, I, I was working on a project where we were doing exactly this because the equipment was getting so complex, the best way to do like high level controls was to actually just use machine learning algorithms to do it. And I mean, I, I say this, but like, you know, I just moved to the Valley nine months ago and like, you know, I live in this magical place where there's autonomous vehicles running down the road every day. And um, so this is, this is pretty obvious here, but it's not, not maybe obvious to a lot of the, the rest of the world. So it's exciting to be in a place where this innovation is happening. Um, so with that, like, um, I had a, um, you know, we always like to, so I do work at a company that tries to like sell software services. So we always try to do um, kind of interesting demos. And um, so the demo that, that I have here 
Um, it's actually not big data, mostly because I sometimes have to demonstrate this on my laptop. Um, but it was, um, it was a data set that was generated um, by the, I forget the exact name of the professional society, but it's the Prognostics and Health Management Professional Society. So the people that do machine health and prognostics, they wanted to see if um, machine learning um, you know, or data mining techniques could actually be used to predict uh, remaining useful life. So they went out and they got this uh, software um, actually from NASA down the road called the Commercial Modular Aero Propulsion System Simulation or CMAP software. Somebody, does anybody know this software? Like, right, I've been trying to get it, like my government won't give it to me. Because uh, uh, <laughs> I would like bigger data sets. Um, the, uh, um, so yeah, so they generated a set of uh, uh, data out of this. Um, and what they did is they simulated uh, 250 uh, turbofan jet engine, so 40,000 pound thrust engine, so look outside of the wing of your, of your Boeing or Airbus aircraft, and that's the class of engine we're talking about. Um, they, um, they generated the data, they simulated a few things in the data that made it nice and hard. Um, and the things that they simulated is they simulated manufacturing variability, so every one of them already came out with manufacturing variability, because that's what happens. They simulated um, they actually produced four data sets. The most complicated one is the one I used here, which is they simulated um, two failure modes. So there are actually two different failure modes that each one of these engines could go through. And then they simulated um, them in six different operating, uh, operating regimes. Um, and the challenge was we're going to give you about 250 of these engines to look at, and we're going to run them until they reach remaining useful life of zero, which means they're not useful, like you have to do maintenance or something on them. They can no longer perform up to their specification. Um, and another 250 that you see part of their life, and you're to predict how much, how much time's left um, for each one of them. Um, they also um, came up with their own metric. I always love these. Like, you can't just go use root mean squared error, you know, mean squared error on it. They came up with a metric. And basically, they penalized you more for saying that there was um, more useful life than the machine actually had available, which would be important if you're in a maintenance character, maintenance regime, right? You'd like to actually do your maintenance ahead of time, not, not, not uh, afterwards. That's what we're trying to avoid. Um, so I actually worked in this data set, and then I found this paper, which was, uh, made me um, realize I'd done a lot of work and replicated somebody else's work independently, so I'm, um, that makes me feel good. Um, the, uh, but that's about all it did, because he did a really great job. So one of the things is, like, so you have all these, about 23 sensors of data. You get one observation per operating cycle. That's all you get. And so now the question is, like, from a data, from a um, data representation standpoint, how do you represent it? So the simplest thing to do is just leave it alone. Like, use all 23 sensors as if there were a point in time, and use machine learning algorithms as this nonlinear transformation from the sensor measure to your target variable. The alternative is, is to do phase-based embedding. So somehow either use time delays or derivatives or integrals um, or some other phase-based embedding and, and use that as a way to do the, the machine learning algorithm on it um, to represent the data. Um, the challenge is, is that you get to higher and higher time steps. So I, I have this strong belief, and I, I use the title, and I was glad somebody else did it, which is just sometimes the simplest thing works, right? Sometimes it's very simple, transfer from what the sensors are telling you to the state of the system works good enough. And so um, that's, that's actually what I tried. And I had uh, added this, uh, I'd also added this common filter to the end of the machine learning pipeline, uh, which I thought was uh, a new and unique approach until I found this 2008 paper afterwards. Um, the, uh, so, so yeah, so the approach is to treat each point in time. So this is, um, one of the things is, I promise I won't run through this. So if anybody's not familiar, this is, this is a Jupyter notebook, Python code. Like, if we're going to do data science, we're going to look at data science stuff, not PowerPoint presentations today. So is that OK? Yeah, OK, good. The, um, um, so I used, because I work at H2O, I used H2O for everything I did on this. So that seems kind of, kind of obvious. Um, so if you've not used H2O before and are interested, you can use it from Python. Uh, you just import the H2O library. Um, and I've already got this running, but you can run this H2O init, and it actually starts H2O automatically. Um, it starts it not in the Python process space, but in the Java process space, and gives you some diagnostics and says it's running. Um, and that's, that's really all it takes. You do a 
if you want to install it in Python, just um, it's on PyPy. You can do a pip install of it. Um, lots of different places. The um, over time, I've added much of columns, but none the data they sent didn't come with headers, so I had to define all the headers. That's not so interesting. This is this is kind of the first step. Is um, you know, so one of the things about H two O is is that uh, we try to make it look as much like uh, pandas and scikit as as pandas and scikit is. So um, because when we did the, the R API came first and the Python API came later, and um, I'll tell you, like the first version, this is all an open source. Like if you go to GitHub, you can go find the history and figure out what the old API looked like. Um, so in the old API, it was it looked a lot like R. Um, and the Python community went, whoa, 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 like, uh, we're, like, hold on here. Like, um, so we went back over the summer and, like, completely redid the Python API. So if you've touched the Python API, let's say, five months ago, it's completely, it's not completely different, but it's almost completely different. And, and we tried to align it much more into what, like, the Python community is used to using. So um, the simple things like uploading files, put the train and data set into H2O, um, you know, there's a method just like you'd expect in pandas called describe that give you summary statistics. Um, like I'm not going to walk through all these. This is uh, this is maybe more interesting. Is is that um, we actually uh, when this data came in, it didn't have a target variable. It didn't actually have remaining useful life. It just had cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, cycle four. So you needed to create the target, which is how many were left, counting down to zero. And um, the um, you know, the reason I showed this off as code is not a specific code to learn H2O, but it's, um, it is a little bit. But the whole point is, is like, this is typical, like, kind of feature engineering stuff that you might do in any sort of business context, too, which is go take a data frame and group it. So I had to group it by the unit, which is the name of the turbofan engine. Um, figure out what its maximum cycle is. So do some sort of summary statistic by group. Um, merge that summary statistic back into the original data. And, uh, and then in this case, run a final step of actually calculating that. So the, the thing is, is like when you run this, um, I believe I can actually, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and run this. So this is all, this is H2O commands that are making call, I mean, this is happening, the commands run in Python, but what's actually happening is, is there's a, um, uh, to get a little technical, there's an abstract syntax tree that's getting built of all of these commands, and then they're getting sent to H2O and H2O is executing all these commands in Java in its engine. So that's kind of the, the trick of how, how the interpretation works. So this, this is the, the bit and piece of an example of doing that for data prep work. So not only is it for machine learning, we're doing more and more data prep stuff inside of the, the product. So the next thing was, um, you know, works from a demo perspective is, uh, it's kind of nice to do some exploratory data analysis. So I did load up NumPy and Panda. So H2O doesn't have too many plotting features in it. Uh, if you're looking for those, but what it does have is it has the ability, um, you know, it's open, um, open in source, but it also, like, even the uh, API allows you to go in and pull data from the H2O memory space into the Python memory space, so you can use all your Python tools for doing it, and this becomes a little bit important later on in, like, this example. Um, so I pulled it up. This is, uh, I'm using Seaborn. Uh, I won't get into Seaborn unless... Like, I'm not a seaboard expert, but it's made down the road. Um, but what's interesting, these are all the sensor measures that were given for three of the machines. Um, and time is headed from this side to that side. So remaining useful life zero is on the far side of the graph. The, uh, your, your right, my left. Um, and what becomes kind of interesting as you look at these sensor measures over time is, is that there's no, there's no trends in them. Um, which, which makes making prediction really, really hard. Um, there's also all kinds of weird behavior. Like here's a couple that show like they, they fluctuate around a certain level, but sometimes they dip to different levels. Um, so yeah, so now the question is what's, what's going on with these sensor measures? Um, so one of the things you can do is, remember I said they had uh, six different operating settings. They have, uh, um, the operating settings are given by um, actually, um, three variables called operating setting one, two, and three, and they're in six different modes. And so this is just a plot showing that there really are, um, this is operating setting one on um, the closest graph to me and on the far side. And what it basically says is like sensor measure four, when it's in some 
one of the operating settings, it actually, it actually clusters together, and it clusters together over here. So this, is, this gave me hope um, on this data set. Um, so now the question is, like, how do I go and like, take advantage of that? So here I'd used a clustering estimator, k-means estimator that's inside of H2O. So this is the first time of actually seeing like building a machine learning estimator in H2O in this example. Um, and so I'm building a k-means estimator. Um, and so you can, it looks a lot like what you would do inside of Scikit, except it's happening on H2O. And so it can work on really big data where you configure the estimator uh, and then you train the estimator and then you use the estimator to then go do predictions. Uh, and in this case, it's used as a feature engineering step because it's actually creating the predictions and then adding them back on to the, um, to the original data frame. Um, there is a little bit of R stuff that occasionally comes in, like CBind, um, R-like stuff. But uh, that's, what's, that's what's going on here. The interesting things about those estimators, and I won't get into them tonight, but they're actually scikit estimators. You can stick them inside of your scikit pipelines, too. Um, Got to be a little careful because if you ever need to move data, to one that's local in Python and one that's in H2O, like it does, it, it, there's some, you know, it moves your data between two memory spaces. So, um, but yeah, you can write full kind of um, pipelines like this inside of H2O and it works. So this is what I was doing and then um, lo and behold, I've now colored each one of these different, you know, the k-means clustering actually worked. It ought to work in data that's clustered like this, right? I mean, it ought to cluster together. Um, and so it pairs them all up. Um, and so, more, do you want to walk through all this? Code? No, I'm not going to do that tonight. I will not make anybody suffer through that unless they want to see it. So, more interesting is, is like, it's still, with the clustering, um, the, and, and the reason I show this is, it's a more complicated feature engineering set of steps that H2O supports, right? So, there's, what, there's um, more and more capabilities to kind of do this feature engineering. And what this one is doing, uh, again, is it's doing some sort of grouping uh, by, um, by mode, um, calculating some summary statistics, mean and standard deviation, and then it's actually normalizing the train and test data only based on the training data, um, the mean and the uh, standard deviation of each sensor measure. Um, so it's doing this whole group by, and then it's doing this huge kind of feature transformation that's happening to all of those measures. So there's a little bit of looping because it's not, can't do everything um, just with simple commands, but it does eventually uh, walk through each one of these. So that you can imagine like you have all these sensors and every time you change operating mode, the center of where the sensor is is changing. So you're trying to recenter it by basing it on which operating mode it is. So you change each one of the operating modes to be centered independently by unit. And so that's uh, what this code does. And like I said, I, I leave it in here um, as an example of kind of like more advanced feature engineering that's, uh, that's kind of in HTO's capability. So now we can, we can go visualize the sensor measures over time um, and this is good now because uh, they, they, vary, they vary over time. Uh, these are all, you know, they're kind of noisy. Um, this one's terribly interesting because it doesn't vary over time and it seems to change, have different levels based on which machine it is. These are interesting because they vary over time but they diverge in which way they vary. Some go downwards, some go upwards. So these are the different types of failure modes that are going on inside of the data. Um, it never told us if they, how much was manufacturing uh, variability in it. Um, but now we have hope, right? We, can, we have hope that we can make, find some transformation of like some you know, set of data. This would be like this, some row of data, um, which is now represented through a line in time, into remaining useful life. Um, one more, yeah, good. I'm sorry if I missed this. No. So they didn't tell us. That was what made the challenge even more not fun. So they removed all the context. They just said, like, we're going to give you 23 sensor measures. We're going to we're going to we're going to simulate sensor noise and bias. I forgot those were added. Oh my gosh. And yeah, they didn't actually like. They wanted to remove all the ability to use context on the problem. Um, and I miss that context because I would love to. Like that context is so important for actually. Doing, yeah. So they, like they wanted to remove all the context from the problem too. Um, I usually run away from data sets that say things like variable one, variable two, variable three, but um, this, was, uh, this was like an interesting one enough to work on. So yeah, no pressure, no anything. Ugh. Yeah, temperature, nothing, none of it. So um, I'm hoping, I've actually got, um, I have a, 
I have a, a, a commercial customer on the line that actually said like, hey, can you do work on turbofan, like, turbofans? And I was like, yes, I can. And so they're coming with like 2,000 features that are actually named, and I'm really excited about that data set actually. So it's, uh, uh, and instead of giving me one, one reading per operating cycle, it'll be like yeah, at whatever hertz number I kind of request it to be at. So um, we may have to actually ship hard drives back and forth to each other or something. I'm, I'm, I'm just terribly excited, really. <laughs> so the, uh, this is another, like, so eventually I got to the point where I needed to do a feature um, that um, was a little bit harder to do, which is I wanted to have a cumulative addition. I wanted to know how many times it had operated in each mode. Um, and you know you get to these things through trial and error, right? So I discovered this through trial and error. Uh, the thing is, is like one of the first steps here. Um, so um, as much as I tried to do that inside of H2O, I couldn't do it. Um, but luckily, like I said, it has this nice Python API or ARP API. So I just pulled over the s data that I needed, the three variables I needed, not all the data set, and then did the feature engineering I needed to do drop the stuff I didn't need, so I didn't need to pass back in the operating mode, you know, make the data as small as possible, and then passed it back to H2O, and then did a merge, which is actually a joint operation. Um, and then a uh, little hack in here, too, because H2O will evaluate this lazily, and I just wanted it to not do it, so I ran a command and didn't give any output. But this adds another feature back in H2O, but it doesn't do it in H2O, it does it over in Python, and you can add it back in, so I think, like, um, at some point, like, you try to do all this stuff inside of one tool, but it never satisfies everybody's needs. So, like, this is an example of, of like, just finding a solution to the problem. Um, so I have a, nest, a practice of, like, exporting my data now that I've done all the processing and saving it back and then loading it back in. So now we'll, so that I've saved that data out, and then I'll load it back in here, and I'll actually do some, some demos here. So that was me loading data into H2O. Um, then uh, this is, uh, um, there's, there's a bunch more variables in that data set than I actually uh, decided to use. So I, I name which ones I want to use and I kind of display them here. So like these are all the counts in mode. I removed all the sensors that had um, zero variability and standard deviation within the operating mode because they just didn't tell us anything. So, you know, this is kind of, that was a feature selection step that happened. Um, it actually happened in this code, it calculated um, I won't scroll back up, where I did the calculation to get these new ones, these standardized sensor measures, it actually checked each one to see if there was any variance, and there's no variance um, in any, you know, across the different pieces, it just dropped it, so this is like a feature selection step. Um, and then finally this is, so the challenge was to predict on machines you haven't seen before, so this is, um, for those that haven't dealt with, you know, lots and lots of data, like, you know, one of the tricks is, is just figuring out a good cross-validation strategy. Um, and um, th the cross-validation strategy I used was the same one that the challenge used, right? It's very straightforward. Here, you're going to build models on lots on some machines, and you're going to predict on ones you haven't seen before, as opposed to building models on machines you've seen and trying to predict something about, like, data sets you haven't seen on the same machines. Um, so having dealt with, like, a lot of spatial and time series data, uh, two, like you have to be very careful about autocorrelation issues if you're trying to do prediction. Unless, of course, what you're trying to do is memorize, and then autocorrelation can be your friend. Uh, the uh, um, so yeah, so this is this is just doing a cross validation, and then um, I have a larger version of this notebook where I actually run through every algorithm H2O uses. So for supervised learning, so it does GLM, random forest, GBMs, and neural networks. Uh, I will, I did, I took that out of this version to kind of be more focused. So this is um, the, this is the gradient boosting estimate, so gradient boosting trees. It's a method to do, uh, to learn nonlinear features. Um, the, um, so H2O, the smart people that are there, like the people that like rate the core engineering, like they wrote the first open source version of a parallel distributed GBM. It's kind of a, a big deal. It took like working with, uh, um, working with lots of people to figure out how to make it make it happen, but this is this is all it takes inside of H2O to build a gradient boosting estimator. Is you import gradient boosting estimator, you set it up with its distribution, um, and um, one of the things is is like there's uh, I'll say enterprise class things in it. So this one actually says like. When, when H2O GBM runs, if it has a validation data set or cross validation data, it will um, 
it will, in one pass, both build models and score on validation data. So there's, there's no kind of multiple passes of like build model, then pass in some other data set and do validation. It does it all kind of in one pass. So what this chunk of code that I've highlighted does is it says, score at each tree that you build in the GBM, um, uh, use some sort of stopping metric. This isn't, uh, uh, this was the best one that was available kind of from the selection. And stop building trees when the improvement in the validation data set decreases at a certain rate. So it's like, it's a way um, to avoid using a lot of computation power if you don't need to, to kind of ease up and say like, okay, I'm done. So at 0.1%, this one, after five rounds of 0.1% or less, it stops. Um, and so I'll actually, we're gonna try, let's see, let's start there. Reimport the data. Uh, yeah, display those. I've done these demos enough times, I oughta, this ought to just work. The, uh, and then we'll rerun it, yeah. So yeah, so that's building a GBM model. It's doing five-fold cross-validation. Uh, it's actually building six models in the background, one for each one of the folds, and then the final model uh, where it looks across all of the different models and decides which is, the, which is the right number of trees to build. It's the only metric that's kind of available for it uh, when you have these stopping rounds. Uh, so it does some averaging of those. Um, and then um, just to, we may have to zoom in here. So. Uh, one of the other things is, is that, um, uh, make that go away, uh, model, get all the models. So this is the H2O user interface, um, and uh, this would be the model that I just built. Um, make this go away. I've got it, I don't have to look up there. Um, so this is the GBM model that I just built. So there's always like this UI that goes with it too. This is the scoring history on the training data. Um, these are the metrics for it. These are the variable importances across all of the different uh, cross-fold validation models. Um, you can see there's one sensor that like uh, contributed most to the decrease in variance of any of them, the sensor 11. But then it was mostly a matter of which modes you were in. So um, big surprise, the number of times that you operate it has a big impact. Uh, and then some other sensor measures. Um, you can always go in and like check each one of the cross-validation models and see how the validation data and the training data is performing, um, that it has an overfit. Uh, you can check the variable importances so you can do sensitivity analysis. So every cross-validation data set's there and so you can check all of those and check kind of like stability of models. There is one cross-validation data set in this that's uh, um, four out of five perform really well and one of them like has has a lot of these variables flipped around. Uh, so it's, uh, I haven't dug into it enough to figure out if I can get some improvement there, but it's, uh, it tells me that there's something to be had. Um, so yeah, so you can look at summary statistics right inside of Python. Um, that's what these are. Um, the, uh, the plots that I just showed you for the cross-validation model are also available inside of Python. So you can stick them in your Jupyter notebook and look at them, or you can go back and forth over to the UI. Um, in H2O, there's hyperparameter searching. Yep, good. Oh yeah, everybody's been waiting for this, right? So let me go down to the end. Um, there's grid searching. So now this was the question is like, okay, I've got this data and I've actually looked at doing, I had written a bunch of code that was like cross-validation data on it. And I, I just didn't really feel like it was performing great. So I did a couple of different tests of common filtering. So one of them was actually just, um, and it was almost a lazy method, which is really just a, like a smoothing and signal processing method. So I took all the sensor measures and used the EM algorithm to like build a common filter and then pass the, the sensors through as kind of a smoothing mechanism. And that performed okay. I mean, I've done a lot of sensor data and done signal processing on it to get rid of the noise in the data. LiDAR data was particularly bad. So what I ended up doing, how many are familiar with common filters? Everybody came to a title that was about common Okay, so you're all experts on them and I barely know how they operate and I'm talking about them. I'll guarantee you that if you use them day to day, you know more about them than I do. Uh, so good. Uh, so don't beat me up, but do beat me up because I want this improved. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> so for those that aren't familiar with common filters, um, is it's, a, it's a signal processing technique. That's one way to look at it. The reason that they're used in these is, is that um, they're a way to model linear dynamic systems. So the belief is, is that the assumption is this is some sort of linear dynamic system. You know, every time you operate it, the belief is, is that the remaining useful life ought to decrease by one, right? So if it doesn't, like we can use common filter, we can use our prior knowledge and the, uh, 
and the data from the machine learning to do them. And um, so there's some good introductions to common filters for hackers, uh, which is what I am. The, uh, the whole step is, is like you believe you're in some, some sort of state. You um, make a prediction of what state you'll be in. So in this one, I would predict if I'm like got 200 cycles left, I would predict that I'm at 199 for the next one. Uh, but then I measure them. Uh, and then I use, uh, you know, the filter that says, well, if this is my measurement and this is my belief, then my, my posterior probability ought to lie as uh, um, these two uh, combined. Um, and I'll just leave it at combined. Uh, and so what I did for this with common filters is um, I actually treated each one of those cross-validation models. And, I, and, the, and then the bigger one, I have like 10 models because I pulled some GBM models and some random force models together. And so I use those as, what, now that I've done this nonlinear transformation from the sensor measures to remaining useful life, I use those as input into the common filter, um, complete with this prior belief that you should decrease by one. So that's what, that's what kind of all of these steps in code do, is that they say they ensemble all the machine learning algorithms afterwards through a common filter. And I think this is, this is probably like the only, to your point about like the, what were you measuring? Like I don't know what I was measuring. This is probably the only place I was actually able to bring like any domain knowledge to bear, right? Any context, which is every time I operate these, they ought to have one less, one less cycle of remaining useful life in them. Uh, so this builds um, the, the state and the transition matrices for them and then pushes them through a package called PyCalman <coughs> to do that. Um, and this finally does the final scoring on the data set, including the really weird exponential scoring on it. Um, this score, 1626, uh, is, was in the top 10 of the competition data set. So I used kind of, you know, um, the, the top ones used, um, the top ones used, this is interesting and something I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Some of them used uh, regular kind of fully connected feed forward neural networks. I haven't actually gotten a feed forward neural network on this to like converge. So I don't try, I get lots of local minimums and they bounce around every, every kind of stochastic, every step that they take. So I just kind of stuck with uh, GBMs and random force for it. Um, and believe it or not, that score produces a model output that looks like this, or this is the actual remaining useful life. And this is the predicted one. I, there's some bias in this model. And obviously the less you've seen of it, the more noise there is in it. Uh, so there's probably, there's lots of opportunities to improve this. Like I said, it's only a top 10 score. Um, but yeah, that's where the common filters actually came in, was combining the output of the machine learn models, this transformation from sensors to remaining useful life in some nonlinear way, then ensembling those together to actually, to, to build the output. So that was, that's, and I think those are interesting places to like jo go join things together. Like there's no reason why people that have, we got years and years of sensors and signal processing stuff together. Um, what else am I doing on this? Oh, I started experimenting with uh, like uh, um, recurrent neural networks. Uh, I'm not an expert or even very knowledgeable in them. So I think um, there was like a, a follow-up competition that was sponsored in this and like all of the top five were all uh, um, LSTM recurrent neural networks. Um, so there's a lot of space in that. I don't have an algorithm in HO that does that, so I didn't do it. Uh, the, uh, um, so I kind of have to keep it there. Um, so I think with that, thank you all. I'll hang around for however long anybody wants to chat about anything or anybody wants to give me critical feedback. So I appreciate that. So thanks everybody. Enjoy the great facility. Yeah.